All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Good Today, morning. Good morning. Oh, we have Gretchen. Yay. Oh, One more. <laughs> <laughs> so today, what we have are two stories that are connected, but likely not from the same source, about how Saul became king. So King Saul, is, or Saul, is the first king of Israel, and we have kind of the folk tale of how Saul became king. And we know it's more of a folk tale because the, the language is kind of more folksy, more legend-like. And then the other one is more of the historical annals, more technical version. And we'll discuss both of them. And, um, but the thing I want you all thinking about as we discuss this is what are Saul's qualifications for the job? Why is he specifically chosen why do people think he will be a great idea for or uh, as their first king? Mm -hmm. uh, because he's or, very tall. <laughs> right? <laughs> and then we can spend some time at the end kind of thinking about how this compares to our world today and the leaders we choose for ourselves. Well, he's also mentioned as very handsome. Right. And I remember back in our presidential history, was it Calvin Coolidge who ran like right after the ladies got the vote and he was good looking and ladies voted for him. Um, I remember reading about that. I used to teach American history and I remember reading about that. And thinking, okay. I was also told that that is maybe one of the reasons why Kennedy won is because it was the first televised presidential debate yeah. and Nixon looked not good on screen. <laughs> he did not. Yeah, he did not film well. That's that's true. He, he just had he had an elongated face and just just you know, you're right. He didn't present well as a, you know, mm -hmm. as you said. But yeah. they said of Saul, not only was he handsome. He was taller than the, all, everybody else. That's what Gary said. He was taller. Yeah. So, I yeah. mean, so all of this is kind of laid out in I, I was verses one and two. What like what are the character descriptions? Like, yeah, he's a head. He's not just tall. He is a head taller than everyone. This guy is massively tall. <laughs> and Which, and he's wealthy. He's wealthy. He comes from a wealthy, wealthy family. family. Yeah. And all that suggests power. And that's right. You so, know, this is this is a true thing about the height mm -hmm. that the studies have been done about men's height and uh, that what, what positions they attain, at least in business. Mm -hmm. uh, they are more likely to attain uh, higher uh, paying jobs, mm -hmm. more staff. Mm -hmm. and, and you have to be <laughs> handsome. I mean, really, let, let's just face it. that That's part of it is. Mm -hmm. You don't choose somebody who is unattractive, mm -hmm. which is a crazy thing. I mean, mm -hmm. and why is it that it's handsome and tallness? What's about them? Why? <laughs> so, so a few interesting, just like historical things that I find interesting. Um, just looking at the record and looking at archaeology and the size of people Saul is probably only about six feet tall like <laughs> by our standards today he's probably pretty average but um with not as good nutrition shorter or there's a lot of things going on he's probably actually only about six feet tall or maybe like six foot two six foot three but like culturally this guy's going to look like an NBA star, like just like Matt, like a head taller than everyone. And he's attractive. Um, and my, my question is, can you all think of why we attribute beauty with goodness? Because there's a lot of studies that sh they call it the halo effect that be like people that are, um, the term we use in my, in, between Logan and myself to like talk about statistics and like things is genetically average. 
um, genetically average means that like your face is symmetrical. Uh, you, you have the average of all cumulative traits, which is a scientific way to say that you are conventionally attractive is genetically average because you have all the average of all the features in the like your nose isn't big or small. It is genetically average. It is the right size. So why would be that be advantageous? Hmm. It's a comfort level, I would think, of, of, of yeah. familiarity. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's nothing threatening about that. Uh, they yeah. don't, they look sort of like us. Okay. And what I was thinking, if you think of art, look at all the statues. You know, there aren't any statues of fat, ugly people, you know, or at least very few. You know, they're all sort of idealized sort of a person. Same, same way in a lot of paintings uh, as well. Mm -hmm. So there's like this ideal that you're striving to obtain. Mm -hmm. um, and Sue, I like what you're saying. It's comforting. Like there, there's something that mm -hmm. just is like, okay, there's something correct about this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the inverse way to think about it is why do we find physical abnormality strange? What what kind of is there like a signal that it like sends off when someone has just an unusual feature? They're fascinating. Yeah. Well, we're sort of brought up that way. I mean, we fear the wicked witch of the west. You know, <laughs> right. uh, you know, threatening things brought up during our childhood in the Grimm's fairy tales. I mean, you know, they frighten anybody to death about somebody that looked different. Mm -hmm. I personally think it's just a really interesting question. Mm -hmm. but, but, and it's more, what, what, I mean, research is, they're working on this. Somebody's working on this. You know, why, yeah. why? Why are we like put off or offended if somebody has looks different? Is it the other that is a problem for us that we are quote genetically normal and the difference is the mm -hmm. brightening? Um, and I thought the Grimm's fairy tale was it. I was thinking about the witch look. Mm -hmm. um, Big noses. Yeah. I but I find it I think it's really an interesting question. Why? What in our psyche makes us want people that look yeah. boring? You know, <laughs> when yeah. Jean had to use a walker all the time. Yes. I mean, we it didn't make any difference where we go. Everybody knew who she was because of that walker. I mean, you go to a restaurant, you go to, uh, that, you know, a party or, or anywhere, you know, it's what what people see when they look at someone mm -hmm. really is important in what they feel their identity is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's a few ways I've seen this kind of explained in kind of two ends of or of the like attractiveness spectrum. There is one where scientists are saying that, hey, we're looking at human evolution, which is a long time in mod modern society is just like a drop in the bucket for the amount that the human species has been on the planet. When you wanted to reproduce, you were incentivized to look for the like most good looking person. Mm -hmm. Like visualness or our visual presentation was often us. I mean, it's a visual indicator. It's like, is there anything in the genetic code that's kind of messing up here? Mm -hmm. Um, which is a uh, kind of explains our in like there's something instinctual of like our aversion mm -hmm. to people who are very is especially on like the ends of features where like so mm -hmm. you know that something's genetically kind of gone sideways and maybe maybe that's not the best person to um 
reproduce with. But it's also, if you think of more like chimps and apes and our primate cousins, the ones that tend to be the leaders of packs tend to be one the one that presents all the features the most idealized. And mm -hmm. so there's, I mean, if you're thinking of like peacocks, like the peacock that peacocks the best is the one that gets to make babies. And so I think there's something programmed into how we look for both leaders and mates that biases us towards the our idea of beauty. Yeah, Clay? I'm thinking about Eleanor Roosevelt. Her parents were considered the most attractive couple of their time period. Mm-hmm. And then they have Eleanor, who is not <laughs> considered attractive. Even her, her mother rejected her <laughs> as being homely. And that's how she, you know, went through a lot of her life. Um, that, that's how she identified was that, you know, that was that she was homely. And yet one of the most handsome gentlemen of his time marries her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And marries her basically for her. For her mind, for his conversational mm -hmm. skills, that kind of thing. And yet, when we look at her, she's become revered. So even though she still remained what we would call homely and not ideal looking, over time she became revered. So there's sort of that to stick in there also. What makes it okay to well, yeah, and she yeah, to idolize like someone who isn't the perfect looking i mean that's just all kind of coming to me now as i thought about that um what is there that makes us maybe change our mind towards someone like that when they don't fit that perfect role um but yeah she's one of the ones that just comes to mind with me like oh beautiful couple they'll have beautiful babies that oh was, yeah you know so anyway <laughs> and there is and i never thought she was that bad looking i i you know i think people it, it was the you know, nowadays you put on makeup and you look fine. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, it, there is a, a maybe side point, but if anybody is interested, there is a, a young people's book called Wonder. And it's by R.J. Palaccio. And it is about a severely, uh, has a severe facial deformity and it it's a it's a fine book <laughs> and it talks about what it's like to be I mean completely different you know an eye off to this and I, I, I think that I don't know I just uh, if you have a chance take a look at it and it's just yeah. uh, I think it was a did, it, did they make it into a movie I don't know anyway if in in children's sections of libraries, like uh, it'd be like sixth grade and fifth grade, that, mm -hmm. that, that's a very helpful book mm -hmm. for people who like, like Larry says, when Jean had a a walker, mm -hmm. and so it, it would be a helpful book for children when there is a child in their class who have something akin to having a walker. Right? Mm -hmm. But it's interesting that the stories that we have of people in relationships that you have like one conventionally attractive person and one not conventionally attractive person, we often see this as like inspirational stories. Like it's mm -hmm. actually held up because it's unusual. Mm -hmm. which is fascinating to me. Um, mm -hmm. So the other thing that scientists may think is going on here, which is one that I find wild, it's called Uncanny Valley. So, and it's talked a lot about when looking at um, animation or like animatronics at like theme parks, that there is a point where like people enjoy realism and it's getting closer to realism and it's getting closer. And then there's a really big, plummet where people get extremely uncomfortable right before it gets so realistic that it's indistinguishable and that is called the uncanny valley because it's the valley of human acceptance 
And I would say like CGI in the like mid to late 2000s was often in this area where people were like, it's realistic, but unsettling. People sometimes have this feeling about like dolls or clowns where it's like, it's, it, it's unsettling and I don't know why. Um, and sometimes animatronic, like robot, like things like it's so human, like, but not that it like sets up like the creepy heebie jeebie feelings. And there's just this weird feeling that a lot of humans experience when things are close to being human, but not. Mm. And one of the thoughts is this was a protective strategy in our evolution when we weren't the only hominids, when there was like Neanderthal or other bipedal species that were on our same trajectory, you needed to know that the Neanderthal is similar to us, but not quite. Although we know our species interbred with them nonetheless, but there's other ones that it's like differentiating between us and them was evolutionary advantageous, but it seems like we carry with us this kind of unsettling, uncanny valley where, and I think this tr triggers sometimes with disability as well, when we see someone who is mouth, um, gen who developed with um, abnormalities, sometimes when people like don't have like the same amount of fat on their faces, when limbs are kind of developed weird, it triggers that like same uncanny valley thing of like that thing's similar to me, but it's also not. I don't know what to do with this. I don't want to deal with this. And that's kind of an explanation of why humans have the, like this weird, funny feeling sometimes with humans that don't develop in the genetically average category. Okay. Uh, another yeah. thing I think when we see someone with some obvious deformity, you know, we, you know, we don't want to, it, 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 it may scare us or affect us or think, well, gee, but, you know, we know, you know, we shouldn't feel that way. We should be accepting people. So we try very hard maybe to overcome some of those innate, innate sort of feelings mm -hmm. of racism or deformities or, or whatever by overcompensating for it. Right. So this is one of the things where, um, why I wanted to spend some time talking about this is there is a beauty bias that exists still today. We see it in this text where it's very clear people liked Saul because he was handsome and tall. <laughs> yeah. He was the ideal on a visual perception or yeah. in, in a visual quality. He also might be tall and good looking because he came from a wealthy family, which means he was well fed, which just meant he was able to grow and give all the resources to growing and not struggle and put out in the fields early. So like all of these things are connected, but it's one of those that unless we are consciously aware of this, we make the same choices today <laughs> where they find, or like there's a few things where it's like, if you're a tall, if you're a taller man, yeah, you you have a higher likely to like rise through the ranks of companies. Attractive women tend to get higher salaries than unattractive women. But the big one they're doing research now is if you are overweight, you have significantly lower salaries. So we are still very much animals that are making creature decisions that does not actually reflect our morals and sometimes it's on a subconscious level and so i'm gonna argue here that there's a subconscious level that some of the people in this story are acting upon that makes saul look like a great candidate for king yeah, right <laughs> so other than being oh the other thing to point out it's not that saul made himself wealthy he is the son of a wealthy man, wealthy man. Yeah. Yeah. so he has inherited wealth he is tall and he is beautiful does he have any other qualifications? I don't know of any, uh, but it seems like Samuel instantly wanted him or. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, there's no, yeah, there's no discussion about whether or not it was a suitable, really, you know, that he had any other <laughs> positive attributes. Yeah. I mean, think about the list of attributes we put together 
when we were talking about Samuel and Samuel being the choice for a leader and how much like we want someone who was discerning, we wanted someone yeah. who would listen to the people, be out there. None that discussion is gone. Yeah. <laughs> So let's actually talk about the stories, not just, oh, I saw two hands, sorry. Um, no, I was just going to mention um, that um, they also mentioned that when they say young man, that he is probably middle age, which is often the ideal age for us to um, approve of someone as a leader, in addition to being tall, handsome, mm -hmm. you know, wealthy, educated, whatever, also the age range. And, well, he probably, if he's middle-aged then, it would have been in his 30s, maybe. Yeah, I mean, so he would have been of an age that everyone would say he's not too young, he's not too old. So that was just a note uh, within <laughs> yeah. my within my Bible. He's not a teenager, and he's not oh, an old man. No, right. Yeah, Gary, did you have a thought? Uh, I don't know just how to interpret it, but in uh, two, it says... He had a son whose name was Samuel, a choice young man and a goodly. And there was not <laughs> among the children of Israel a goodlier person. <laughs> uh, you know, maybe that had to, something to do with character. Yeah. Um, let's see, that's verse two? Yes. Uh, let me look up the Hebrew there. Because where your Bible translates it as goodly, mine is translating it as handsome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, goodly. And yeah. tall, and tall. He stood okay. head and shoulders above everybody <laughs> else. <laughs> so let's find out what the Hebrew word is, because that's that's going to be our, our okay. true guide, uh, because there's always interpretive choices. Um, well, goodly... It doesn't really mean that they're good anyway. It's an old-fashioned word, and I think it really... No, it, it may mean handsome. You know, he, he had a goodly countenance. You know, yeah, like, yeah, that sort of sounds like sort of, Jane Austen. Yeah. It's just a... Okay, modifier. so the Hebrew word is used often to say like a choice calf, um, tender and good. So it's um, oh in another one that it's talking about favor. There is goodly, but it's talking about prosperity and the land was good. So it seems oh. to be an indication of um. There is an indication of quality, but quality. it seems to be mm. in the sense of like a quality cow is one that looks pretty good. So it. It has appearance implications while also being about like um good quality. This one's a good stock. Yeah, yeah, good. So it it yeah. seems to and this is interesting, the word seems to conflate the visual and the moral. So it seems to already in the language be conflating morality and visual looks. So he is handsome, but the handsomeness is seen as an indication of like he's he's from a good family. <laughs> good is a, uh, I didn't I never yeah because we think of, are you a good girl when they say to little children have you been a good girl or a good boy? Uh, they're really talking about behavior. Yeah, yeah. Gretchen, did I see your hand? Well, isn't there something? I'm trying to think where the story is that God does not look upon you as in in uh, your height or who you are, but upon your heart. And is is that story? Isn't that connected with Saul at some point? But or where is that? Uh, I, I mean, you know, we do that with children. We say, "Oh, God doesn't look upon," and then we say, "Well, wait a minute, but God does look upon who is handsome." I mean. It's I mean, <laughs> this is one that, or there was a video essay that I watched a little while ago. Um, a historian was discussing the Victorian obsession with beauty and ugliness. And like the Victorians very much thought that if you were beautiful, it was because God looked kindly upon you and you were part of the chosen. And that kind of like status as part of the elect 
could be seen by how pretty someone was. Mm. And being ugly was a sign of moral depravity. So like people have made that connection of it seem and it kind of seems to be there a little bit. But this is where it's always interesting to take a step back from the text and saying, okay, are people writing about why they chose Saul and kind of putting God in the story? Or is God choosing Saul because of beauty? Or is God choosing Saul because Saul has a purpose and the people explain it as God chose him because he was a goodly guy? Mm -hmm. huh. Because newsflash, Saul doesn't end up being the upstanding king everyone wants him to be. He has a downfall. He's good for a while. <laughs> And then we're going to read about why he doesn't end up being good in the long term. So anyway, so that's Gretchen. I would have to look a little bit deeper to uh, I have to see think about it myself. Is. I'm sorry. I just, it just no, it's all good. seemed like a Sunday school lesson, mm -hmm. you know? So to jump into the story itself. So we, we kind of see the explanation of why Saul is chosen. But the story itself is, well, his, his father's donkey, a few of his father's donkeys have gone missing. It is notable why one of the reasons why it is mentioned that um, his father is wealthy is this is his donkeys being missing is not a life destroying loss. He can lose a few donkeys and it's going to be OK, but he still sends his son and a servant out to retrieve them. And evidently, it's been a three-day walk across the hills, and they haven't found them. And then Saul is nervous that, like, hey, we've been out so long. Dad's no longer worried about the donkeys. He's probably going to be worried about me. So let's turn around and head back. But his servant has a brilliant idea. Hey, I heard there was a prophet in town, a man of God in town. Let's go ask the man of God what's going on. And maybe he can give us a hint and then we can go back. And so they make the trek to town. They, um, in verse 10, or no, it's verse nine. There's like this odd little comment explanation about the language, about it being a seer and a man of God, which they say, was probably like a margin note that got misplaced and just stuck in here. So if you're wondering what that was, it's commentary um, that made it into the text itself. Mm. Anyways, they come across a lady, a woman who is describing, she's kind of explaining the context of what's happening. She says, go on ahead. He's going into town. He's going to do a sacrifice. Um, after the sacrifice, because if you remember our co our conversation in like Exodus, if you do a sacrifice, part of it is God's part of the sacrifice, and then everyone else gets to eat the other half, and then you kind of have a meal with God. And so after Sam Samuel blesses the sacrifice, they're going to have a feast as a, as a town. So go get him before he does the sacrifice. Because then everyone's going to be partying. It's going to be really difficult to get a hold of this guy. <laughs> so this is the situation for the first story. And what do you think of this kind of setup? That it's kind of just happenstance that, well, he's just chasing down a few of these donkeys. And, well, yeah, let's just go ask the man of God and see if he has any advice. Okay. Yeah, Larry. I thought it was ironic that the wealthy man didn't have any money and he had to borrow it from the servant to pay to pay the seer for his advice. <laughs> I just wonder, why did they put that in? <laughs> you know? It's like, you know, Leah, <clears throat> Leah Iacocca never carried any change, so he never had to buy a lunch. <laughs> <laughs> To me, this actually kind of sounds like a rich kid thing. If you're used to living and like all your needs being provided for, why would you carry money? You, <laughs> you wouldn't think to carry money. <laughs> so they end up being able to catch up with Saul or, or Saul catches up with Samuel and God, like right before or before this, God had given Samuel 
the indication, hey, I'm going to send someone your way. This one's going to be the king. So just heads up, he's heading your way. And so when this really tall, handsome dude comes walking up, God's like, that's the one. One, yeah. <laughs> and Samuel kind of like stops in his tracks and has this conversation inviting him to the sacrifice and to eat next to him. Yeah, Gretchen? You know, you could do a movie on this, couldn't you? Because you've got everything. You got the young women and then you have them dance, you know, because they're <laughs> young women. I mean, what a story. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. So to kind of show that Samuel is not just like talking out his rear end, he also does a little bit of prophecy. <laughs> prophecy hey by the way Saul donkeys have been found don't worry about the donkeys we need to talk about your ancestral house and he's like talk about my ancestral house like um and his response I find fascinating of I am only oh a Benjaminite from the least of the tribes and my family is the humblest of all families <laughs> and I was born in a log cabin <laughs> right. He's like, oh, my family, we're, we're just a poor little family from this little <laughs> tribe. Meanwhile, he's like the rich kid in town. <laughs> um, it's meant to show that he is um, not. This is actually probably him trying to be humble. It was culturally appropriate for him to make himself sound less than uh, less than he actually was. This isn't like him likely having misconceptions of his wealth it's kind of like a oh my goodness a politeness like oh no we're not that rich kind of a mm -hmm. move which would be culturally appropriate mm -hmm. <laughs> at any rate um samuel and saul or samuel does the sacrifice saul sits by him in the meal and samuel told the cook said 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 part of this <laughs> sacrifice aside we're gonna have a special guest he's coming and then Saul sits down and they're like hey guys this is the special guest mm. and it all of these things are just indications that like this wasn't a chance encounter although it was a chance encounter mm. and it's doing this like double-handed thing where because this was seemingly random the prophesied parts of a seemingly random thing is an indication that God's at work here. Mm -hmm. Who would have known that when Saul went out looking for these three donkeys, that he would have ended up sitting down at a table with a portion set aside specifically for him. Yeah. So what do you think of this kind of interplay to kind of show the random and chosenness at the same time? <laughs> oh, it's, it's kind of sounds like a fairy tale. Um, <laughs> But they didn't do fairy tales back then, did they? <laughs> so, I mean, but, this is still, I mean, not is fairy little... tales in like the grim fairy tale, but this this part of the story, like I said, the first part is a folk tale. This is yeah. likely, like if you think of women's work, um, they actually think, or I've seen research saying they often think women were the storytellers because they're doing things like sitting and spinning wool into yarn. They're sitting and weaving. They have a lot of, processes where they needed to be stationary for a long time and do repetitive tasks and you join together with the other women and you tell stories and this they think is what likely falls into that category of folk tale legend this is sit around the campfire and tell it story so you're you're not wrong it does have that aspect yeah larry but the text is i think indicating that in spite of this sounds like a nice story, God is still in control because it says God told Samuel, God did, yeah. you know. So you still know that this is be being uh, produced by God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is more like God pulling puppet strings. Yes, yes. Yeah, and, and God is portrayed in this section that we're reading now, where he's more of available he's more um, mm. you know chatty one-to-one -one. Um, <laughs> yeah as he had been not like that for a while so it's interesting yeah. i mean that's a great observation and one mm -hmm. of the reasons why samuel is really held up 
as one of the the big uh, characters in the story. I mean, the book's named after him for heaven's sake, and he has two books. Um, but Samuel has this close relationship with God, this very uh-huh. like first name basis we talk all the time, and we haven't seen that since kind of Moses, Moses. I mean, a little bit of mm-hmm. Joshua, but definitely Moses had this kind of relationship. And some mm. of the other judges, they'll have like moments of it, but then it kind of like fell away. It's why Samuel's kind of special is he maintains this closeness. Mm-hmm. So after the meal is done, um, Samuel tells Saul, go back home. And there is a continued prophecy of you're going to run into three things. Um, or actually first he says that the Lord, or he anoints Samuel. So let's talk about anointing real quick. Mm. So it, the word is masha and it is to pour oil over someone's head. It is normally fragranced. It is perfume like, but their fumes were not, or perfumes weren't alcohol based. They were often oil based. So how you would make a perfume in that day is you get the the nice things that have lovely scents and you soak it in an oil and then you collect it. And if you can refine it slightly, then you have a perfume. And that is like he's probably carrying a little tub of it, of this nice, fragrant, good smelling oil. And when they part, uh, Samuel is like, "Okay, I'm going to dump this very lovely smelling perfume all over your head. (laughs) <laughs> Just going to give you a nice deep conditioning treatment. Um, d- so he smells nice. And you, if any, you've known anyone that wears way too much perfume, you can like smell them coming. Um, it's supposed to have that kind of aura effect of kind of announcing the person before they arrive. And that is the sense that it is a physical action that is supposed to be Uh, to also have a spiritual reality. Mm. So in the same way that you have this kind of cloud of good smelling stuff around you, you're also supposed to be, have this like cloud of good spiritual energy around you because you are God's chosen one. Mm. Notably, Masha, when you put, when you change the ending a little bit, is how you get Messiah. Messiah Hmm. is just the anointed one in the original Hebrew. So in this story, Saul, Mashaz, Sam, or Samuel, Mashaz, Saul, and Saul becomes the Mashah, the Messiah. This was an act often reserved for kings and the sick. The sick have a smaller anointing process. It is often because salves and bombs were oil based once again so you would like if you would have like a cut or a burn you could have a priest anoint you with like a a balm that would help you heal and so this like today we have a spiritual anointing of oil that we will do sometimes for ordinations or um i know i have a little Thing of oil if I ever if someone if I went to the hospital and someone wanted to be anointed but it comes from a practice of literally the priest had certain balms that would help people heal and it was a type of medicine so that's why you anoint the sick but you anoint kings as kind of a symbol of the spiritual reality and then the anointed king is the messiah notably the Christian community changed the meaning of that word So when you're hearing anointing and thinking of like the blessed anointed one, if we're in the Hebrew text, just know that it means something very different than what we associate with Jesus. So at this point, Saul is the Messiah. Mm. Is that kind of a hard mind bender to get ourselves around Mm. of like hearing that word used a different way? (laughs) Or does it kind of, or can does it kind of make sense in a way? Mm-hmm. Well, in a later time, of course, the Greeks and the Romans uh, had this, this uh, identification with the deity. And I guess uh, the pharaohs did too. You know, they were chosen yeah. deity. Yeah. 
Messiah, save you. Mm -hmm. Amen. And, and I think when you look at Jesus, you think of one Messiah, one person. We're looking for one. Well, with this way, this sort of Messiah, you can have a lot of people spreading a lot of oil and a lot of others. You know, you're not, it's not that everybody's looking for the same one. Mm -hmm. It's important to point out this definitional difference, if only because if you've heard the rhetoric before, that the Jewish people are still looking for the Messiah because they don't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. <laughs> what a different way to say that is. The Jewish people are still looking for their anointed king or their anointed earthly king because they do not recognize Jesus Christ as God himself and son of man. The definition is different. So it's the Jewish people are not looking for the son of God, they are looking for an earthly leader is what, um, but there's no one that is, it is generally speaking, different people get the term Messiah. It's not actually accurate to say like the Jewish people are still searching. They're not, but they also have a very def different definition of what it means to be a Messiah. So we're speaking on two different levels and it's just mm. good to know that. Very, very good. Very helpful. Yeah. So after he is anointed king, he is told that he's going to reign over the people. God chose him. Um, well, not just God, the Lord chose him. Um, it's another reason why we think the other one's more of a folktale. If you notice, they were using the word God and not the Lord. Now we're in Lord territory. <clears throat> and so um, <laughs> you're going to see these three things. Uh, two men by Rachel's tomb. Three men going up to God at Bethel and a band of prophets. And you're going to like dance and party with them. And you're going to be a prophet too for a little bit. And so that's just a sign that God's still at work and can like pull in the strings. And sure enough, he meets the, the two men by Rachel's tomb, the three men going up to Bethel. And he starts prophesying and people find it weird. Um, they're like, uh, this guy? The rich guy's son is a prophet, huh? And it's just a kind of a funny little story. So, so that is the first story of how Saul is anointed king. Thoughts about how this went down or? Well, we all know that, that there is an irony in this prophecy kind of thing with Saul because we've read the rest of the story. But mm -hmm. we won't talk about that today. Right. We, we'll come back to this again, I think, in a way. Right. <laughs> so while this story leads directly into the next one, it is assumed that these are two different traditions. Because Saul gets chosen as king twice. The explanation in the text is that the first one is just Samuel anointing Saul as king and kind of this personal interaction where the prophet and the king to be kind of had this personal interaction he knows he's chosen he's anointed but no one else knows he talks to his uncle but he doesn't tell his uncle that he's been anointed king <clears throat> instead the other story which seems unconnected uh if you believe all the historians Samuel is going to, uh, Samuel summons the people of the Lord to Mitzvah, which is kind of his base of operation. And he's like, hey, 12 tribes, I'm going to anoint a king. You all should come. Um, and there's a little bit of a prophecy from the Lord where we see some of the same rhetoric and some of the not different stuff. Thus says the Lord, of the God of Israel, I brought you up out of Egypt. I saved you from the Egyptians. I saved you from the neighboring tribes. Uh, <clears throat> but you have rejected me. Ooh. So we have this additional line. You've rejected me as king. So now I'm going to give you a king. Um, so therefore, present yourselves before the Lord, and the Lord's going to choose one of the people in front of you. So the way that God does this is by basically choosing lots it's 
I, they don't specify exactly the process used. It is probably the two stones that we talked about, where the priest, if you remember, he has the breastplate and there's the two white and black stones that he keeps in his breastplate. It is likely throwing the stones and basically you need two yeses for it to be an affirmative and either one yes, one no, another different yes and a no or two no's is a no. So it has to be two yeses for it to be approved. The other way to think about it is it may be something akin to drawing straws. But I think the, the assumption is it's with these two stones. Anyway, so it's like, okay, we have the 12 tribes and they throw the stones for the first tribe and it says no. And the second tribe and it says no. And the third tribe, it says no. And then the representative of Benjamin comes up and it says yes. And so it's like, okay, we know it's in the tribe of Benjamin. So all the families in Benjamin send a representative. And once again, they're throwing the stones and it's like, no, no, no. And then it gets to Samuel's family and it's like, yes. And they're like, okay, we've narrowed it down. So all the men in this family walk before it. And then it's no, no. Um, somehow this is done without everyone present because all of a sudden by throwing the lots, Samuel is chosen as king. Saul. Oh, Saul. Saul. Yes, Saul is chosen <laughs> as king. But he can't be found. He's accidentally oh, missing. <laughs> and so they say, oh, bye, Clay. Um, they say like, oh, we need to find this guy. God just chose this guy as king and we don't know where he is. And some person's like, oh, yeah, um, he's over by the baggage claim. <laughs> and evidently he's just like hiding in the baggage. And so this is like all of the tribes of Israel turn to this guy who's hiding. And then he stands up and everyone's like, oh, shoot, oh. this guy's tall. <laughs> head and shoulders again. <laughs> Once again, this guy is like a head above everyone else. <laughs> and so he kind of walks up and Samuel's like, hey, is this an appropriate king? And everyone's like, yes, lovely choice. We like the tall guy. And so mm. that's when the people of God choose Saul as their king. So what do you think of this story as <laughs> the second way that Saul gets his kingship is by throwing lots, by him hiding, and then uh, impressing people when he stands up? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Larry. You know, the, the contrast between the two versions, you know, th this last one, you know, it's the rulers, it's the hierarchy, you know, th the leaders that are really making all the decision and choices, you know, whereas the folk, the first one, you know, it's on, hey, geez, I lost a couple of donkeys and I'm out looking in the country for my donkey. That sounds more like down to earth sort of people, sort of fairy tale sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it feels more like Cinderella going to the ball and it has yeah. that like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Gary, did I see a hand? Yeah, I I uh, prefer the first story because the second story, it brings up too much of the gambling aspect. Mm. It's just, it, it doesn't have much substance to it. Yeah. Oh. Well... God is pulling the strings in a different way. While we see throwing dice as being gambling, the people genuinely thought that's how God was going to talk. That if you, like, almost like a magic, I would compare it more to like a magic eight ball, if you truly believe that God controlled the magic eight ball. And so with their heart and soul, this is, this is kind of standard practice in the ancient world. God talks and God will influence the stones. Yeah, Gretchen? Well, it's interesting. This whole, the are you talking about Uman and Thurum mm -hmm. as, as the rocks? But yeah. anyway, you know, people being chosen by lot is really a, uh, it goes through the whole Bible. And, uh, you know, my background is Moravian. And they have a book of uh, daily, da daily uh, texts, and 
for 500 years, or maybe a few less than that, they have been choosing what text is on each day by drawing it. it and it, now for us, I always think of this as, you know, that's just chance. But originally, probably it had a sense. I choose this text and it was going to mean something for that particular day because God said this is the one to choose. And I, it, it's an interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, so here's another, a different way to look at it. The first story from the, the perspective of the people. God God chooses and Samuel anoints this guy and they have no say in the process. All of a sudden, this random rich kid is just anointed king from the perspective of the people. Whereas the, um, the second story, it's a participatory process and theoretically, everyone is evaluated where they went through all of the land and kind of looked at, okay, so which tribe is best suited for leadership? Which family in the tribe is best suited for leadership? Let's choose someone in this family. And there's a chance that like any of the young men could be chosen king. And it's not something in like, because it's up to chance, it's actually leveling of the playing field. Like theoretically God is helping the dice or the, the throw of the um, um, German. But if you don't believe God is doing that, then it's a, it, everyone has a chance. It assumes almost an equality of the people mm -hmm. and that anyone had a chance to be king. And well, this guy is chosen king. Should we give this guy a chance? Well, he's really tall. Maybe he'll be a good king if we give him a chance, but it's, it, there is both the hierarchy because you kind of see like the clan structure and the 12 tribes. But when it comes to chance, it, I think it actually has kind of this feeling of proto-democracy, not not democracy as we understand it today, but, but a feeling of it. Yeah, Gary. I'm not comfortable with that because God's controlling the stones. <laughs> Nobody had a chance. <laughs> I'm just giving as always I'm giving multiple ways to look at the text and so mm -hmm. by the by the conceits of this own story yeah God's controlling the stones but it's still one of those that the people get to see the process there's a transparency to it where God it's not just that God is actively choosing this one it's that God is actively not choosing these that it's not that like Saul was chosen because God was lazy and he was the first person to approach him, his prophet at the right time, but there is actually a process that the people can see God enacting and you have a little bit more trust in your leaders if God says like, hey, <clears throat> yeah, this one looks good, but I'm choosing this one. Um, this guy had a shot, but didn't pass the God test. But then God's so um, you, kind of say, give them what they want, and then they'll see. Yeah. But, yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, God's, or at least how the writers are writing God's dialogue. Right. God's not a fan of the kingship. Yeah, yeah. Didn't God say to the people, you wanted a king? All right, here's yeah. the king. <laughs> and they had kings for a long time. Yeah. So, Gary, did you have another thought? I thought I heard you start in. Oh, I guess you just have to buy in 100% uh, mm. on the chance thing. that, And uh, it's a good mental uh, work out here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. The thing is, not everyone bought in. We see at the end of the chapter in verse 26 that Saul goes home and the people from his hometown are like, this guy? No, thank you. And so they don't buy him a present. They don't do anything. 
Yeah. And this may be part of the inspiration behind Jesus's quip that no prophet is ex is accepted in their hometowns. hometowns. This is one where it's like <laughs> the people know him too well and they don't they don't like this choice. They're not going to buy him a present. It may be a snub, but they they dissent. <laughs> so So the end of the chapter is kind of a lead in of what we're going to do talk about next week. So I'm going to hold off talking about the Ammonites because that's going to be Saul's first campaign is dealing with this tribe that's gouging out people's eyes. <laughs> so when it comes to choosing leaders, how does, I mean, we just went through an election process that is not the same as this. Are there things at play that are similar? Are there differences? Like, what do we, like, Saul is constantly talked about as being tall and handsome, and that's his qualifications. How do we reflect on this in our situation today? Are we still the same kind of people, or do we think that God's in our democracy or do we really think that it is just people? Um, I don't know. Just, just some, ref uh, if you have any thoughts on leadership today versus how it's being chosen here. Well, there, some of the uh, Christians on the right think that Trump is on a chosen person i think um it certainly isn't his physical appearance i don't he's tall he's tall and um and they and they also saw the assassination attempts which he survived as a sign i mean there there's some of that uh but generally yeah. i think we leave religion out of the choices. I mean, I know Billy Graham used to be buddies with certain presidents, but um, and some of the the candidates we've had, their only qualification looked to me like they had good hair, um, but that certainly wasn't <laughs> true of Biden and uh, and Trump. But there are some that have had really good hair, Kennedy kind of hair. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So. I do think that's interesting. Um, I have family members who talk this way, who very much that the people they voted for, they see as being chosen by God, yeah. which I find interesting in the system that we have because we are a multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-religious nation, yeah. that it feels odd trying to use the same language as God's chosen or God's anointed. Yeah. And what that means if you disagree, if you dissent and when some some people are saying it's chosen by God. Mm -hmm. Well, in the New Testament, uh, you know, we have we have uh, the, the Paul thing about, uh, you know, honoring your leaders. They've been chosen by God. And, and so you can see why for some people who read it all literally they would say this is this is the truth if somebody is elected they must be chosen mm -hmm. and we are we're supposed to respect them no matter what because i mean if you read is it rome isn't it romans it's that paul says you know yeah be nice to be you know they've been chosen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Larry. If if you believe in one man, one vote, you can say that Trump was elected by the majority of people. Therefore, a majority of people had some reason for voting for. And if you look at you know, it certainly wasn't his necessarily his physical attributes, his appearance or anything. It clearly wasn't, you know, the type of life that he perhaps has led that would be necessarily 
with appealing to people. There were some negative things about his behavior and his attitude and the way he treated people and so forth. There was very little positive from that uh, standpoint. So, but the, the overwhelming reason wasn't how tall he was or how handsome he was. It was, it, it, it was some other basic thing that prompted people to vote the way that they did. Mm -hmm. So I guess my other question then is, so we don't choose our leaders by drawing straws. No. <laughs> and we don't have a national priest or pastor anoint a king over us. We very much, uh, the founding of our nation, or even before our nation, we kind of rejected the idea of a king that was chosen by God. But the the thing I'm going to leave with you all today is, is God still in the process? So as mm. Presbyterians, <laughs> our assumption is mm. if all the Presbyterians are praying and, dissent, and discerning and considering issues... If we vote together as a praying, discerning body, we are going to get closest to God's will. If we're all doing this together in careful study, granted, we also have a big belief in that God alone is Lord of the conscience. And so if you disagree with the majority, you are allowed to. But as Presbyterians, we have faith that God is present in at least our church uh, voting system that we vote for pastors whether or not we feel called we vote for elders and deacons whether or not we think they're called and we seem to have faith that god's in the system but is it I, i'm not looking for an answer this is one that i'm gonna because we're already at time i'm gonna let you think about is where is god in our national system and is is this something where we need separation of church and state? Do we vote with our our Bible in one hand and the Constitution in another? Should we be looking for God to choose our leaders? And if so, how? How are we looking for them? Are we looking for divine inspiration or morals? Or how does that look? It, it doesn't vary from... <laughs> That's why I said rhetorical questions. I'm not asking you to no. answer right now. It should, it, this is the homework assignment. It's just like thinking about this of where God is in our current system. So with that, any final thoughts for today? All righty. Well, let us pray then. Pray. Mm -hmm. I just can't let her sign off though. Gracious okay. and loving God. While we try our best to be the best humans we can, we know that in some ways we are still very much animals, governed by instincts, governed by our genetics and evolution, governed by culture and society. We do a lot to try to overcome some of these limitations. We try to learn about other people and be accepting. We try to think uh, or to consider how people may live differently than us, who may have bodies that are different than us, who have experiences that are different than us, and try to understand what that is like. And God, we ask that you always guide us as we choose our leaders, for it is important for how we guide our culture and our society how we care for one another, and how we care for the least of these. Help us to choose leaders that are not just attractive and tall. Help us choose leaders that are more than just people who say the thing we want them to say. Help us choose leaders that fit the moral compass that you have given us, that um, can help guide our, our world to be kinder and gentler and more loving towards all people. And so today, especially, we ask that you guide our leaders that have been elected for the roles that they are filling are never easy, but may you be a source of inspiration and wisdom 
for them in their jobs. And so we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Chris. All right. Uh, after you sign off. Uh -huh. What was that? After you sign off, I have a message. Okay. All right. Take care. See you, everybody. Thank you.